First Peter um, really is a comforting passage. You know, Peter was writing to a church that was going through uh, incredible trials, persecution, loss of belongings, loss of life. And they were being persecuted because of their righteousness, uh, their their walk with Christ, um, not their loud vocal ranting, but their their sober, faithful, steady walk with Christ in the midst of all of that. And that's a great witness, you know. Um, I think it's a far greater witness than a loud megaphone. Um, just to live that walk with Christ. And, and Peter writes to him, beginning in verse 3 in chapter 1. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Aren't you glad that he has caused us to be born again? It was his Holy Spirit that drew us to him. It was the Holy Spirit that opened our eyes to the fact that we were utterly sinful and separated from the God. It was the Holy Spirit who caused us, gave us the ability to have faith in Christ when we heard the gospel message. And we made that decision. It was a volition of our will, but we made that decision to trust Christ. But we never would have come to that place to make that decision had God not first drawn us. And so Peter, Peter praises him, has caused us to be born again uh, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He has called us to an inheritance, and that inheritance that he has called us to is all that's in Christ. We inherit all the blessings that the Father had given to the Son not in the perspective of this life, but an inheritance of eternal life. That's the hope that we have. You know, when my dad passed away six years or so ago, we, we sold the house, the old home place that I grew up on. And all of us siblings, we, I, I'm not, I don't know, mind sharing the amount. We got about $20,000 each, and that's nothing really. Um, but, you know, I have no idea what that $20,000 is today. <laughs> um, it's gone. It, it, it's faded away, it's passed, it's been spent. But when I think of that uh, and the inheritance that we have in Christ, it will never fade away, it will never pass. It is for all of eternity. Verse five, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our faith our salvation is guarded by God. There is nothing that can take that away. He has saved us, and he has saved us for all of eternity. There is nothing in this world or outside of the world that can pluck us out of his hand, the Bible says. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. All of these things we have, all of this stuff, it's going to go away. Ra ra moth and rust are going to destroy you, Jesus says. But he's prepared for us a place in eternity that nothing, nothing can ever take that away. He goes on to say in verse 6, he says, In this we rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Um he has called us, he says. We rejoice, though for a little while. And that little while is at three score and ten. Life is full of suffering as life is full of pain. There may be seasons of great joy, but uh, hold on. <laughs> there's going to be suffering and there's going to be pain. That's just a consequence of living in a sin-wrought, fallen world. But he says this, if necessary, though for a while we're grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of our faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When the fullness of our salvation is revealed, though for a little while we suffer and our faith is tested, and through those trials for the believer, 
Uh, those trials are the purifying work in our lives. Just as coal, uh, gold is purified through the process of, of refinement, uh, through the crucible's fire, uh, so these trials purify us. If we allow God to work in us and if we respond to him, in a right way. Trials can either make us bitter or they can make us better. It's one of the two. The choice is ours. But God will work in those to conform us to the likeness of Christ. Then he goes on to say, though you have not seen him, you love him. I love that. Though you've not seen him, you love him. You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. There will come a day when every one of us will attain, we will obtain, we will see the result of our faith, the fullness of our salvation. Yes, we're saved now, but when we cross over, when that day comes, it's appointed for every man to die, the writer in Hebrew says, uh, when that day comes, we will see the fullness and the revelation of the salvation that Jesus has bought for us. Concerning this salvation, I'm going to go on, verse 10, he says, The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to him that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that you have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Aren't you glad? And there was one that, um, that was preaching, that was prophesying in that sense of declaring the word of God. That there was a day that the Holy Spirit uh, put you in that right time, in that right place to hear the gospel message so that you might be saved. Um, this morning, um, that, that ministered to me, that blessed my soul, the word of God, that, man, he has acquired for us a faith, a, a, a hope, an eternal salvation that there's absolutely nothing in this world can take away. Rejoice in him in that. Would you pray with me today as we, as we close that, that God would have his own way in us, that, that we would allow the events of life to change us, to conform us to the likeness of Christ, and allow the Holy Spirit to work even in those painful times to conform us to the likeness of Christ. There is a, a hope that we have, and it's secured by the blood of Christ, and there's nothing that can take that away. Would you also pray with me in closing today that God would use you and God would use me that wherever we are today, may we be a Trevor and invite somebody, uh, plant a seed of the gospel in their hearts. If that seed's already been planted, that God would use us to cultivate that seed and that God by his mercies and his grace, man, if he would let us participate, watch him save somebody today, wouldn't that be glorious? Let's pray and ask God that. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, we thank you that you called us, Lord, that it was your Holy Spirit that drew us, that it was your Holy Spirit that opened our eyes to our sinful state and to your holy being. And God, it was the Holy Spirit who brought the message of the gospel through somebody else to us, that we might hear it, and God, that we might respond to it. Father, we love you. God, we pray your continued graces. Uh, on the Gutierrez family, God. Uh, Father, we pray your continued graces to Joanne Matthews, God, and for others who have suffered loss and are suffering loss. Father, we praise you, though, for answered prayer as well in Mitch's life and others. Father, we pray this morning for Constantine's continued healing. God, we pray for your comfort in that family, God. We love you. God, there's so many prayers, and so, Lord, you know them. God, draw our hearts, Lord, Holy Spirit, Bring to mind those that we're to call on for you today, God, to touch and to heal and to bless. Lord, we love you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Have a blessed day.